Greetings from your dietitian and nutrition support team. My name is Lauren Krebsfeld, and I'm a clinical dietitian at the Michael E. DeBakey VA Medical Center in Houston, Texas. Today, I wanna to give you a virtual tour of a basic ICU room and discuss various equipment you may encounter when assessing a patient in the critical care setting. The first thing I do as an ICU clinician is look at the ICU flow sheet. Now, most institutions utilize computer software that automates their ICU flow sheets. However, institutions in more rural areas still use paper flow sheets. Nurses utilize the paper or electronic flow sheet to document hour by hour what has been going on with the patient. You can find things like the mean arterial pressures, also known as MAPs, body temperatures, weights, ins and outs, and drips on the ICU flow sheet. Now, let me explain each of these important pieces of data more thoroughly. MAPs are important to trend over the course of at least 12 to 24 hours. If a patient's mean arterial pressure is consistently less than 50, it is not safe to deliver tube feeding as their GI tract is not being well perfused with blood. A normal MAP is generally anywhere between 70 and 100. Now, if a patient consistently has MAPs below 50, they're usually on vasopressors to keep their blood pressure elevated. A vasopressor is considered a type of drip, and drips are another name for continuous medications, such as sedation and antibiotics that are given in the ICU setting. Drips are given via automated pumps. When assessing a patient, it is imperative to look at the drips to see which medications your patient is receiving. Medications can determine your course of action as a clinician. For example, if a patient is in fact receiving vasopressors, you may want to either hold tube feeding altogether or give a very small amount of tube feeding, which we call trickle feeds. To learn more about tube feeding on vasopressors, please review our YouTube video entitled Antral Nutrition Topics Introduction to Pressors. There's a lot more information on tube feeding and vasopressors in that video. Lipid-based sedatives are another type of drip to be on the lookout for as an ICU clinician. Lipid-based sedatives contain calories. Lipid-based sedatives generally contain 1.1 calories per milliliter, and it is imperative these calories are taken into account when dosing tube feeding formula. At the end of this presentation, we'll review a case study where I use this calculation to determine a tube feeding goal rate. But next, let's review body temperature. Nurses record a patient's body temperature several times per day on the ICU flow sheet. This is useful for the ICU dietitian who uses an equation such as the Penn State equation to calculate estimated energy needs. The Penn State equation requires the clinician to plug in the patient's highest temperature, or Tmax, as you might see it, into its formula. Generally, the patient's highest temperature in the last 24 hours is used in this equation. Another tidbit of information you can find from the ICU flow sheet is the ins and outs. Ins and outs are important to record in your nutritional assessment. They can give you a picture of a patient's hydration status. Essentially, the nurse will record all the fluids that have entered the patient's body in the course of 24 hours and all the fluids that have exited the patient's body over 24 hours. Thus, you have your ins and outs. Ins and outs are also important to record in your nutritional assessment. If a patient is volume overloaded by several liters, you may want to consider a volume restricted tube feeding formula. If a patient is negative several liters of fluid, this patient may be considered underhydrated or dry. In this case, you may choose a formula with more free water or increase your free water flushes. Other things to look for in relation to hydration status in the ICU setting include ascites or edema. This video will not go into depth regarding conducting a nutrition-focused physical exam in the ICU, but keep in mind to complete a physical exam during your assessment to check for these commonalities of under or over volume overload. Next, let's discuss organ failure in the ICU and the different types of equipment that you will see in the ICU setting to support different types of organs. The first type of organ failure we will focus on is lung failure. If a patient is having difficulty breathing, they will need an assistive breathing device. You will want to observe what type of respiratory device your patient requires. Now, there are two types of respiratory devices in the critical care setting. There is non-invasive mechanical ventilation, and invasive mechanical ventilation. If your patient is wearing a BiPAP mask pictured here, this is a type of non-invasive mechanical ventilation. Another type of non-invasive mechanical ventilation is high flow nasal cannula, also pictured on your screen. Providing oral or enteral nutrition support while a patient is requiring non-invasive mechanical ventilation can be challenging due to the patient's heightened risk of aspiration. Per Aspen, carefully consider the rationale for enteral nutrition in the patient receiving high flow modes of ventilation, especially if the patient is receiving sedation at the same time. 
Patients who are receiving high pressure respiratory support via non-invasive mechanical ventilation may experience what we call gastric insufflation. This is where the belly fills up with air. A patient with normal muscular function who um, is able to belch or burp to relieve the abdominal distension and then may also then be able to eat or take internal nutrition feasibly. However, a patient with a weak diaphragm may be unable to belch and may experience gastric bloating and fullness due to swallowing extra air from the breathing device. Early satiety and gastric bloating may cause the patient to be unable to meet their internal nutrition goals due to feeling full. Venting the gastric tube may relieve this condition and increase feeding tolerance towards goal if the patient has a PEG tube. Other strategies include using a gastric decompression valve bag, if your institution has those, to relieve some of that additional pressure and allow feeding toward volume goals. At other times, supplemental TPN or PPN is used for patients requiring prolonged non-invasive mechanical ventilation. The next piece of ICU equipment to familiarize yourself with is the ventilator. The ventilator is a type of invasive mechanical ventilation. An endotracheal tube, also known as an ETT, is placed in the patient's airway to allow the ventilator to assist the patient in breathing. A ventilator can also be attached to a tracheostomy tube. When a patient is on a ventilator, the term used to describe this is intubation or ventilation. If your patient is intubated or vented via endotracheal tube, they are at an increased risk of aspiration and the safest form of enteral nutrition for them to receive is via continuous feeding using a tube feeding pump. In order to initiate continuous feeds, a patient must have enteral access. This is achieved by placing a small or large bore nasogastric tube into the patient's nostril and guiding it towards the patient's stomach. Another approach to achieve enteral access you can commonly see in the ICU setting is to place what's called an orogastric tube into the patient's oral cavity. A patient's nasogastric or orogastric tube is ready for use once its position in the stomach is verified via abdominal x-ray, also known as a KUB. Continuous tube feeds are generally started at a low rate, such as 20 mils per hour and titrated to goal over the course of 24 to 48 hours. For example, one way to titrate feeds is by advancing the formula by 10 mils every six hours to goal rate. It is imperative to ensure that water flushes are ordered on the tube feeding pump to keep the nasogastric tube or orogastric tube from clogging. We call this maintaining tube patency. In other words, you do want to prevent clogs by scheduling programmed water flushes on the feeding pump. If a patient has a nasogastric tube, it is also important to advise the medical team to switch the nostril that the tube is placed in at least every two weeks to prevent complications such as nasal skin breakdown inside of the nose or sinusitis. The next type of organ failure we will focus on is kidney failure. When a patient goes into renal failure in the ICU setting, sometimes dialysis is considered if it will benefit the patient and align with the patient's goals of care. Since dialysis is a process that removes large volumes of fluid from the patient's body, generally patients who are critically ill cannot tolerate large volumes of fluid being removed over the course of three to four hours as is typically seen in hemodialysis. So if a patient with low blood pressure already in the ICU setting loses too much fluid at one time, their blood pressure could plummet even lower if they're on dialysis that also pulls off fluid at an increased rate. For this reason, fluid must be pulled off slowly over the course of the entire day using a process called continuous venovenous hemodialysis, also known as CVVHD. Sometimes you also see, see the term CRRT in the medical record. This is continuous renal replacement therapy. A picture of the machine you can see on the screen. Um, this machine, like I said, filters the body's blood over the course of 24 hours. Um, if it, as a patient heals and gets well in the ICU setting, sometimes the renal team can switch to what's called shift dialysis, where the patient only receives dialysis for 12 hours a day. So it'd be an improvement um, for the patient if they were able to switch from 24 to 12 hour dialysis over the course of the day. A patient experiencing this level of critical illness should ideally be rounded on daily or every other day. Objective data to consider includes the patient's volume status and lab values, including BUN, creatinine, serum bicarbonate, potassium, phosphorus, and magnesium. Next, I want to jump into a case study that pulls all of these things that you learned about together. We will look at how to use the ICU flow sheet, what pieces of equipment to look for in the ICU setting, 
and how to work that into your nutrition assessment as a clinician. Mr. Smith is a 55-year-old male with past medical history of end-stage renal disease on dialysis. He also has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and type 2 diabetes. He presents to the hospital with chest pain and then has a cardiac arrest. He is intubated or ventilated in the emergency room and now presumably has suffered an anoxic brain injury. His daughter reports that he usually has a good appetite and generally eats two to three meals per day. Currently, he does not meet malnutrition criteria, although weight trends are difficult to assess due to fluid shifts likely related to dialysis. CVVHD is initiated during the ICU admission. The ICU team then requests you to create two penny recommendations for Mr. Smith. You visit him at bedside and start collecting your data. It can be helpful to use the acronym MVPION to guide your decision-making process when evaluating a critically ill patient in the ICU setting for two feeding recommendations. So the M in the acronym stands for MAPS. You will look at the ICU flow sheet to trend the patient's MAPS over the course of 12 to 24 hours. Now MAPS consistently less than 50 would be a red flag for a two feeding start. You do this and notice that the lowest MAP for Mr. Smith over the last 24 hours is 72. This is good information and means that you can likely safely start some type of enteral nutrition for Mr. Smith since his GI tract is being well perfused with blood. The next letter in the acronym is V and stands for ventilation. You notice that Mr. Smith is indeed ventilated and has an oral ETT tube placed in his airway to assist his breathing. This is a form of invasive mechanical ventilation. The next letter in the acronym is P, which stands for pressors. You look at the medication pump next to Mr. Smith's bedside and observe which drips are infusing. Mr. Smith is on a lipid-based sedative and he is on vasopressors. Mr. Smith is running norepinephrine at three mics per minute, so you write this on your notepad. The next letter in the MVP ion acronym are I and O, which stands for ins and outs. You take another look at the ICU flow sheet to determine this information. You notice that the total of all fluids that Mr. Smith received over the last 24 hours based on the ICU flow sheet is about 3,242 milliliters. The nurse also has documented that the total of all fluids exiting the patient in the last 24 hours is 1,200 milliliters. You write down your ins and outs as 3,242 mils over 1,200 mils, which means that Mr. Smith is positive about two liters of fluid, which indicates that he is volume overloaded. The final letter in the acronym is N, which stands for nasogastric access or any type of enteral access. You must determine if your patient has access for tube feeding. You observe that Mr. Smith indeed does have a nasogastric tube, so you write this information down as well. Finally, you observe the continuous venovenous hemodialysis machine at the patient's bedside, which is assisting Mr. Smith's kidneys in filtering blood over the course of 24 hours. Next, we can review his labs and calculate his estimated energy and protein requirements. After this, you can make two feeding recommendations based on this data. The labs here are shown on the screen, but you can see that Mr. Smith's glucose is 202, his BUN is 60, his creatinine is 6.8, his sodium is 133, his potassium is 5.2, phosphorus 5.3, and magnesium 2.9, all indicating renal failure and hyperglycemia. So the first thing we want to do after taking into account our MVP ion acronym data is that we'll calculate Mr. Smith's nutrient requirements. You consider which weight to use and determine that you will use his ideal body weight given he is volume overloaded and experiencing fluid shifts while on CVVHD. Given Mr. Smith's height is 71 inches tall, his ideal body weight is 78 kilograms. For calories, you calculate that he needs 936 to 1,950 calories, which is 12 to 25 calories per kilogram, which is the basic recommendation for someone who's critically ill in the ICU setting of the first one to seven days. For protein, you calculate his needs at 94 to 117 grams, which is 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of his ideal body weight. And for his fluid needs, the medical team restricts him to one liter given his volume overload and his need to um, be on dialysis. So your fluid recs there are one liter per day for the medical team. After you calculate his energy requirements, you consider what two feeding regimen to recommend. Consider Mr. Smith's MVP ion data and his labs. We know that his GI tract is being well perfused. However, he is relying on a small dose of vasopressors to keep his blood pressure elevated. He is on a lipid-based sedative, and you use the ICU flow sheet to determine that he has received 250 mils of lipid-based sedative over the last 24 hours. Let's calculate the calories received from that. First, you would take the total mils of the lipid-based sedative that the patient has received over 24 hours and multiply that number by 1.1 calories per milliliter. Because Mr. Smith received 250 mils 
of his lipid-based sedative, we're multiplying that by 1.1, which equals 275 calories received from that sedative. You will take this into consideration when forming your plan. After reviewing his labs and noting that he is on continuous dialysis with volume overload, you decide on a renal-friendly formula with minimal water flushes. The recommendation looks like this. Start a renal-friendly formula, which is 1.8 kcals per mil at your institution, at a low rate of 20 mils per hour with free water flushes of at least 30 mils every four hours to maintain nasogastric tube patency. Once the patient is fully weaned from vasopressor support, increase tube feeds by 10 mils every six to eight hours to a goal rate of 40 mils per hour. Tube feeding goals will be adjusted as patient is weaned from lipid-based sedatives and vasopressors. At the goal rate, the tube feeding provides 1,656 calories plus your 275 calories from propofol, which equals 1,931 calories and 75 grams of protein. This hits your calorie target, but your protein target is still low. Mr. Smith will require a protein modular to assist in meeting his protein goals once he reaches goal rate on the tube feeding pump, or you could even start the protein modular immediately. Protein modulars can be very useful in the ICU setting given the fact that patients are commonly receiving lipid-based sedatives and their goal rates of tube feeding formula may be too low to meet protein needs. You monitor Mr. Smith's progress daily and make tube feeding adjustments based on his vasopressor drips and sedative drips, and eventually he is at gold tube feeding rate off of the vasopressors and sedation. We hope this video was helpful. If it was, please subscribe to our channel for more educational videos.